For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. amen. If you've been a part of this congregation for a while, no doubt you probably have someone in your family or someone you've known that is buried right outside these walls. You probably visit their grave, maybe even regularly, praying and thanksgiving, and maybe leaving a flower or a flag in memory of their service. We even have a day that's set apart every year in the church to remember the faithful departed, the festival of All Saints Day on November 1st. This remembering of those who have departed is easier for us, especially when it's someone who's a blood relative. So we don't hesitate to remember our parents or an uncle or an aunt or a child that has died in the Lord. For these Christians who rest from their labors, they hold special places in our hearts. I remember fondly grandparents for their Christian witness who now sleep and will rejoice with all the saints and angels in heaven. I remember high school classmates who tragically died and now live in bliss with Jesus. And so the church also recognizes those who are set apart and recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures. St. Mary and our remembrance of her today is no different than the way you remember your friends and family who have died. And St. Mary is due honor as they are as one of the saints of God. She shares in the same faith as you. She has the same Lord as you. She lived in the same forgiveness of sins that you and every Christian receives. The son of her womb died for her sins and for the sins of the whole world. Her son made bloody atonement for her, just as, she, as he has for you. Her son elected her unto salvation as much as he has for you and for all those who now rest from their labors. But it's also true that St. Mary is unique. She is different than probably most of those you remember. She was chosen for a special duty, a noble calling. Like women before and women since, she carried a child in her womb. She, like all women, sheltered that child from the assaults of this world, from those that would seek to destroy that child even in the womb, and especially from Satan while he grew. She nourished him, umbilically sharing in all that was needed for his body. Even after his miraculous birth, she and Joseph protected the infant God from Herod's death sentence and all his wickedness. She nourished him day after day from her breast, carried him in her arms, taught him to walk and to talk. And thus, St. Mary holds a special place in our hearts, just as those other saints that we've known in our lives because the Holy Spirit has quickened our hearts with the knowledge of salvation. We know that redemption for us and for our sin is in the flesh of the child that she bore. We know that God himself gestated in the sanctuary of her flesh. The Holy Spirit, just like for her, fills us, joins us to Christ and to his body, so that we proclaim with Saint Elizabeth, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Again, when we remember the saints, we don't smash them down and make them all the same. They're each unique, uniquely given to you by God, some set apart and holding a special place. It's not because she's more holy in and of herself. Despite all the pious traditions held by some, we know nothing of her own immaculate conception. For all we know, she was conceived just like us, born, lived, and died just like you and me. There are those who believe that she also was assumed into heaven after dying and being placed in the grave. But who knows? For all we know, she was a sinner just as much as us. But unlike all other women who all conceive and bear children according to God's good and gracious will within holy matrimony, St. Mary was blessed to conceive 
not by knowing a man, but by the immediate gift of the word spoken by the angel, that is, by the Holy Spirit. She received the Spirit, she conceived by the Spirit, her voice quickened St. John, who was in the womb of Elizabeth. That Spirit inspired Elizabeth to proclaim out, and it is by the Spirit that Mary herself sang her canticle, the Magnificat. Of course, this Spirit that both conceived Jesus in her womb and gave her voice to sing is none other than the Spirit of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. St. Mary received the gift of God, the Spirit, and the Son in her own body. This blessing and no other made her womb suitable to carry her Lord. The only begotten of the Father is given to her, conceived in her womb, out of sheer grace, giving, gift. She neither merited nor deserved such a wonderful blessing, and yet she received it. Of course, that's how blessings always go. You don't always ask for them, you just receive them. And then, receiving them, you rejoice in them. First you are blessed, and then you are considered blessed. This wasn't the first time St. Mary had been blessed. Apart from all the first article gifts that she had received, St. Mary had already received the blessing of faith. St. Elizabeth tells us, blessed is she who believed, referring to Mary, that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Even before the angel spoke, she was waiting and watching for the hope of Israel, the promised son, promised to Eve. Even before Jesus took up residence in her body, St. Mary believed the word spoken by the angel Gabriel. And that word of God, behold, you will conceive, caused the very thing that it said it would do. She heard and believed and received. That's why her song began like this. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has already looked on the humble estate of his servant. Even Mary confesses that the Lord visited her, not because she was more noble or more special or even just more holy. He visits her simply because she has been made receptive through the word. Again, St. Mary, like every other pious messianic woman of her day, was waiting for their savior. They knew from Isaiah chapter six that he would be born of a virgin, and they knew he would be born of the house and lineage of David. St. Mary was prepared for this word, as unbelievable as it may seem. In all things, she submitted herself in humility to serving the Lord and his word, all by the giving of the Spirit, who created that faith in her heart. And so the angel speaks to her quite simply, and then, in pious reverence, she listened. The blessing that he gives her is the word, now conceived in the flesh of her womb. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Yes, the gift of a child is special, always. But the gift of the Savior, of the Lord himself, is the greatest of all. The Father has given his Son to St. Mary through her ear and into her womb. But it's more than that. As Mary acknowledges, the son given to her is the son given for you and I too. That is for everyone who believes. Because the child of Saint Mary, of course, is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. We call Mary blessed because the father blessed her with the son who would save her. But couldn't we say the same for you? Are you not the blessed of the Lord? Has not Jesus been given to you for you and your salvation? It is said that women will be saved through childbirth, Paul does in 1 Timothy 2. And the bearing of children is a blessing, it is a gift, one received in faith and devotion. But all childbirth is sanctified by the birth of the Son of Jesus, the Son Jesus, who comes and brings blessings not only for her but for the whole world all who call upon his holy name. 
So we could say it this way, we're all actually saved through childbirth. Not through the birth of our mothers, but rather if we mean the birth of Jesus. Because in that son born to Mary is God's mercy for all those who fear him from generation to generation. St. Mary is rightfully called the Theotokos, the mother of God, because God has come to save her and all people. The Holy One who appeared before to patriarchs and saints of old through all of his theophanies, appearances, has now taken on flesh, joined together the impossible, God and man united in one Jesus, who sits enthroned first in the womb of the Virgin Mary. We don't think of wombs as being an impressive throne with might and strength, but rather a place of weakness and powerlessness. And yet that's true. As the artists often depict, the king, the tiny king, dwelling on his throne in the womb of Mary, who is the beginning of the new Israel, Jesus is, the holy Catholic Church. And in this holy church, we all began like little Jesus. The sanctuary, this sanctuary is really the womb where you were made holy, given new life by the word of God. This is, to use the scriptures, a fertile seedbed where the heavenly Father grants new life to sinners and causes them to sprout and to grow. Through the saving flood of the font, which we might think of as uterine waters, the Father conceives new children. That's what the scripture says. It says you're born anew from the font in holy baptism. And when you burst forth into new life from those waters, God continues to shower his blessings upon you. He gives you, to quote the scriptures, to nurse from the pure spiritual milk of the word. And we are to grow in the knowledge of God and his holy word, protected and kept safe in the holy ark of the church. Our faith and our life of love flourishes in his giving, giving us Jesus by the spirit. So it's true that Mary is unique among women uniquely given to bear the Son of God, also uniquely given to believe the fulfillment of the hope of Israel was that tiny child in the fruit of her womb. But you're blessed in her too, because blessed are all the true offspring of Abraham, the new Israel, who are reborn in him, in Jesus, redeemed by his blood, conceived and made holy here in his church, sanctified by his word and nourished by his word and sacrament. Yes, Mary is blessed, but so are you too. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen.